This video is about manually deriving and applying refraction statics for simple near surfaces. But some of the techniques can also be used in more complex static situations. This video assumes you know what a surface consistent static is. In preparation for this video, you might want to watch my videos about the SU Stack Up program and about the SU Res CSV and SU Shift CSV programs. Extensive examples and tests for these programs exist in the demos directories. You might also want to watch my video about floating datum. Look at any reasonable explanation of refraction statics and you see a diagram like this. The signal starts at the shot or vibrator and travels down to the first layer boundary and then travels along that boundary before rising back up to the receivers. That leads to an equation like this for the simple flat one layer case, where the W is weathering layer thickness, the thickness of the top layer, VW is weathering velocity, the velocity of the top layer, VB is base velocity, the velocity under top layer, and TI is the intercept time, the projected time at zero offset. However, it is easy to make some mistakes with this equation. Most of those mistakes involve the intercept time. Notice that this is half the intercept time. This occurs because the signal travels through the first layer at both the shot end and the receiver end of the path. Now, just consider the shot end of the travel path. This segment is not the shot's contribution to the intercept time. The intercept time is the difference in time between these two segments. Because the intercept time is the time at offset distance zero, not at this offset. This segment is not part of the travel path, of course, but when the first arrivals are projected to zero offset, this part gets included so it must be subtracted. Therefore, using the intercept time to derive thickness requires some vector manipulation, which results in the velocity ratio in this equation. Now, consider a typical plot of first arrival versus offset. This line, of course, is the base velocity. Projecting, the zero intercept time looks like this. But that zero offset intercept may be wrong because receivers are an array of geophones. And the signal amplitude is so large that the pick time is often from the nearest geophone. In that case, the pick time should be plotted using the offset of nearest geophone, which results in a different zero offset intercept time and therefore a different weathering thickness. Notice that this may only apply to pick times. If you are manually examining the entire refraction wavelet, then you can judge what you consider the intercept time to be. When receivers are 25 meters apart, the offset of the nearest geophone may be 12.5 meters closer than the offset of the center of the geophone array. For a base velocity of 2000 meters per second, this is 6.25 millisecond time difference. Now, for 2D surveys, this time difference is usually consistent and may lead to a consistent error in the intercept time and therefore the derived weathering thickness values. For 3D surveys, the situation may be worse since the receivers are laid out over an area rather than in line. When the signal arrives broadside to a geophone array, it can cause a noticeable difference in first arrival time relative to the signal arriving in line to the array. 
Since the shots in a 3D often have different trace spread layouts, the inconsistency can lead to geometry footprints within the derived statics. Another issue is that for actual surveys, the intercept time is not an average of the receiver plus the shot. It is an average of the receiver's top layer plus the top layer at the shot divided by two. That is, changes in the top layer means the receiver first arrivals have some deviations, but the shot has the same top layer values for all its traces. Before continuing, here is a reminder of the equation. Another issue is the weathering velocity. The intercept time and the base velocity are derived from the first arrival time versus offset plot seen earlier. But how is the weathering velocity obtained? Often, the actual answer is that the weathering velocity is just guesstimated. Looking again at the diagram, we can see that the weathering velocity might be discernible. Despite the slower speed of the top layer, the direct arrival signal might get to the first receiver nearest geophone before the refracted signal, which travels the down along up path. A direct arrival allows computation of the weathering velocity. Sometimes some kind of uphole survey is done. This consists of drilling holes and then actually taking measurements at multiple depths within the hole. This allows determination of the weathering velocity and perhaps also a direct measurement of the thickness. Note, do not confuse an uphole survey with the uphole time discussed next. Sometimes the shot is in a hole and one special geophone is at the top of the hole. The first arrival in that special geophone is called the uphole time. Or the uphole time might just be picked from a normal receiver near the hole. Note that sometimes the hole is supposed to be drilled to the bottom of the weathering layer. But often the drill is not long enough to get to the bottom so no direct depth measurement for the weathering thickness can be obtained. The shot being in a hole brings up another problem with the intercept time. Dividing the intercept time by two is not correct for shots below the surface. How should the intercept time be partitioned between this shot and the receivers? More, or all, of the intercept time should be assigned to the receivers. The shot depths should be used to adjust the first layer thickness computed from the intercept time. How should the intercept time be partitioned between this shot and the receivers? It is difficult to know for certain if the shot is below the first layer, but using your estimates of the weathering velocity and the intercept time, the sum of the thicknesses of the first layer at the shot and the receiver that has been traversed by the first arrivals can be estimated. If the shot depth is greater than that sum thickness, then the intercept time should not be divided by two or anything to derive the weathering thickness. If the shot depth is greater than the sum thickness of the weathering layer for the shot and the receivers, then the intercept time should not be divided by two or anything to derive the weathering thickness. Remember, the intercept time is always produced by the sum of the effects of the shot and receiver. Dividing by two is an arbitrary choice to average it for very simple situations. Once you have determined the weathering thickness value, the static can be calculated. The next images show an equation for the static of a point P on the surface. This is typical for receivers and vibrator shots. Followed 
by an equation for a static at point Q below the top layer. This is typical for dynamite shots and explosive charge down a hole. These equations only deal with the simplest cases. The rest of this video uses a simple 2D fake survey to indicate how you might proceed for manual refraction, static derivation, and application. Consider a single shot gather of traces. This is a fake split spread shot gather showing only the first arrivals. If the receivers have uniform spacing, you can derive the base velocity easily from this plot. But be careful deriving the intercept time. This is not zero offset. This shot is split spread, but it also has a one trace gap at the shot location. Plotting the traces by offset makes this more obvious. Let's consider some more shot gathers. If you apply linear move out using an approximate base velocity, you will get this display. If you apply linear move out using the exact base velocity, you will get this display. Note that this shot has a substantially different time shift relative to nearby shots. Going back to the shot gathers without linear move out, it can be seen that the shot has a different intercept time, but you have to inspect the shots closely. You will find that the velocity and intercept times are not usually the same on both sides of a shot. This can be caused by refractor dip, actual change in velocity, or other reasons. For small differences, averaging them is usually good enough. Additionally, a shot stack made from the linearly moved out traces may be useful. See my video on the SU Stackup program for information on shot stacks. This is a close-up of the shot stack made from the linearly moved out traces. It shows when shots are different than their neighbors. This is often useful. Similarly, a receiver stack can be made from the linearly moved out traces. It shows when receivers are different than their neighbors. This is often useful. You do not have to produce linearly moved out shot and receiver stacks, but they serve two purposes. They can show where to be more careful when determining the intercept time and the base velocity, they can show when to use an average intercept time from a group of nearby locations to use in the processing technique described next. The processing technique involves the SU Res CSV program. The SU CSV program derives surface consistent residual statics. See my video on SU Res CSV. The processing technique is simply to manually derive statics at widely separated locations, apply the statics from those separated locations to all nearby locations, and then use SU Res CSV to resolve the statics at all locations. Next, fake data is used to show how this processing technique works. This fake survey has a slant to make it easier to understand the technique. The SU shift CSV program applies statics from the nearest record in the Q files. Therefore, for example, you can manually estimate statics at every 40th station as seen in these Q files. 
After that, you can use the SU Res CSV program to derive the residual statics. See my video on surface consistent residual statics. Shot stack after applying nearest manually derived statics. Receiver stack after applying nearest manually derived statics. Part of CDP stack after applying nearest manually derived statics. Shot stack after applying SU res CSV residual statics. Receiver stack after applying SU res CSV residual statics. Part of CDP stack after applying SU res CSV residual statics. Since SU shift CSV applied the nearest manually derived statics, it caused a stair step pattern in the shot and receiver statics before SU res CSV. That was seen in the shot and receiver stacks. But SU res CSV was able to correct those stair steps. However, SU res CSV is limited to determining residual statics to a maximum of about the cable spread length. If you are near that limit, you might need to increase the long wave parameter as seen below, or turn it off. But a safer strategy is, of course, to manually derive statics at smaller spacing, or manually interpolate your derived statics to smaller spacing. Remember this image of a linearly moved out shot stack? If manually deriving statics at just some locations, it is better to use an average shot static from near that location rather than a specific shot because the residuals from SU res CSV are centered around zero. In other words, you should want the long period statics to be derived from your manual interpretation while SU res CSV just resolves short period statics. To summarize the technique, derive statics at reasonable locations. Apply the derived statics to all nearby locations. Use SU res CSV to produce surface consistent residuals. Apply the residual statics. Note that this technique can be employed for any method of deriving statics. This video shows the intercept method because it is easy to use manually since it can be used without picking first breaks. There is always the possibility that multiple near surface layers exist. I am not going to try to review any multiple layer computations. You can look them up when needed. But I will show the refracted wavelets from two layers in order to point out several things. This image shows fake data with two layers. Note that you can see the first layer refraction event even when it is not the first arrival. Similarly, you can see the second layer refraction event even when it is not the first arrival. Sometimes the deeper refraction never becomes the first arrival, as shown above. For multi-layer situations, using the intercept method manually has an interesting quality. Since no first break picking is being done, you can use deeper layers to get the velocity intercept even when the deeper layer never becomes the first arrival because the data does not have far enough offsets. Another point I want to make here is that the initial segment of the path to the second layer does not follow the path of the initial segment to the first layer. So the first intercept time cannot just be subtracted from the second intercept time to derive the second layer thickness.